breathing and yoga. And uh, it was interesting. I was writing a book with Anastasia Stanzi, and the book is called Breathing for Yoga, this one here. And it's quite a deep dive into the application of functional breathing in yoga practice and also in terms of taking breathing off the mat. So in other words, if you're a yoga instructor, that you're not just focusing on breathing while the student is is on the mat, but you're also giving advice for the student off the mat. You know, breathing is so powerful and it is multidimensional. And it would be with yoga instructors having an in-depth knowledge of the physiology, and it's actually quite simple, you know, breaking it down into the biochemical, the biomechanical, and the psychophysiological, that if you do have students coming in whereby their breathing is influencing various health conditions, you could use and weave into your yoga practice different trainings in terms of breathing so that can directly help the students who are coming there. Now, you might ask the question in terms of yoga, where did the whole idea of taking the full deep breath come out of? And is that at odds that are often at what we talk about? You know, we've always talked about for the last 22 years is that our breathing volume should meet our metabolic needs. It doesn't make sense to be over breathing. You know, if you have somebody who's breathing too much air, what's that actually doing? But why, if you were to go in on YouTube and you were, we did that this ourselves, we looked at 10 videos on YouTube and um, how breathing was instructed during a yoga practice. And very often there was a tendency for the yoga instructor to encourage their students to take the full deep breath. Now, this seems to be quite new. You know, the, the origins of yoga dates back, whether it's 10,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago. Nonetheless, it's a long time ago. And for centuries, yogis emphasized the importance of light breathing and subtle breathing and conservation of the breath. And yogis had an amazing ability to hold their breath for a long time. And that would imply then that they had a reduced sensitivity to the accumulation of carbon dioxide, which is really, really important in terms of breathing. Because people with poor breathing, they will often have a heightened sensitivity to the accumulation of carbon dioxide. And if you're overly sensitive to the accumulation of the gas carbon dioxide, your breathing is faster and harder. So you have a faster breathing pattern. You can be taking more air into your body. You have disproportionate breathlessness during rest. You have faster and harder breathing during sleep. And also faster and harder breathing in your everyday life will tend to drive you into this increased sympathetic state, increased fight or flight. Okay, so drawing on a few paragraphs from this book, and actually this section was written by Magdalena Crawler, who has written a PhD on the origins of yoga, breath, and pranayama. And she looked at it from a historical point of view. I'm going to read just a few sentences. I want to kind of show you that breathing in yoga today is different than what breathing in yoga was throughout the centuries. I'm not going to say that, of course, all yoga instructors teach with the, the advice of taking a full deep breath. But one way to get an idea would be if you go to your yoga studio can you hear people breathing inside? You know, are they, are they, do you notice that students there are taking fuller breaths? Um, do you notice that they're, okay, the breath can be slow, but the tidal volume, the volume of air that they are taking into their body during that one breath can be, can be larger. So a good rule of thumb is never to hear your breathing during yoga practice. Your breathing should be in and out through the nose and your breathing should be light. So think about nose, silent, slow, and low. Okay, so that would be absolutely um, a tremendous goal to, to aim for. There was a hygienic movement in Europe in around the 1800s or thereabouts, and people were dying with tuberculosis. Of course, this is a condition that can affect the lungs. And an idea took root that deep breathing particularly filling the lungs up to the clavicles, up to the shoulders, was said to reduce germs that would breed in these unventilated areas of the lungs. And the idea was that he lives most life, whoever breathes most air. Now, that's kind of at odds at other statements that you hear originating from yoga, 
Um, and one that we often come across is that man's life is not measured by the number of his years, but by the number of his breaths. But this is, you know, this statement here from the hygienic movement is at odds with that. So there was an emphasis laid on chest breathing and sometimes on belly breathing. And uh, some advocates stated that the best way to breathe was the full breath that harnessed all three breathing spaces, belly, ribs, and upper chest. Now, this is understandable if we picture how people lost their loved ones as soon as their breath was barely palpable and their chest dreadfully sunken and stiff. It is in these contexts that the idea of deep breathing started to thrive and spread all over Europe America and India by the 1880s. Hygienic culture also promoted nasal breathing over mouth breathing as it was known that the nasal passages could filter unwanted germs from the air, which was also warmed when breathed through the nose. Now let's briefly investigate how this trickled then into modern pranayama. William Walker Atkinson was an American yogi and he wrote under the pseudonym Yogi Rama Charaka. His highly successful yoga manual, the Hindu Yogi Science of Breath of 1904, it promoted yogi breathing. But his manual is truer to exercise derived from the Euro-American contexts than to the yoga traditions. In fact, the only Hatha yogic breathing technique that he adopted was alternate nostril breathing. In his manual, we see, we see a strong hygienic influence some occult ideas and practices, as well as exercise derived from New York's voice culture scene. Now, in all of these contexts, the idea of deep breathing, sometimes called full breathing, was prominent and was promoted as the yogi complete breath. So it actually didn't originate from um, India at all. And in, on the basis of this, it was from William Walker Atkinson. So it was so central that he regarded it it is the fundamental breadth of the entire yogi science of breath. And in this practice, one assumes an erect sitting or standing position and fills the lungs gradually from the bottom to the top. Does it sound familiar? After a brief retention, one exhales through the mouth by first drawing in the abdomen and relaxes both the abdomen and the chest fully after exhaling. The idea behind this breath, in quotes, the quality of the blood depends largely upon its proper oxygenation in the lungs, allegedly being required, being acquired by the complete breath. Now, this, um, deserves a little bit of breaking down. So we see some misconceptions already happening here. While inhaling the big breaths advocated may bring more oxygen into the body, that oxygen is not available for use because the reduced carbon dioxide causes hemoglobin to hold onto it more tightly. Now, this was the, this is the Bohr effect and discovered in 1904. If you overbreed, so if you take more air into your body than what you need, you are bringing more air in, but in the process of breathing more air in, you're breathing more air out. And as you breathe more air out, you're getting rid of more carbon dioxide from the lungs. So you're reducing the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the lungs. And this in turn will reduce the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, leaving the lungs. So the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood is determined by the volume of air that you breathe. And as carbon dioxide is lowered in the blood, blood pH increases. And hemoglobin, which is the main carrier of oxygen in the blood, so because oxygen is it's not very soluble in the blood and it needs a carrier, and that carrier is hemoglobin. And hemoglobin carry, allows 70 times more oxygen to be carried in the blood than otherwise would be. Now, what is this in terms of the context of carbon dioxide? If you're breathing too much air, you're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. This drives up blood pH. And with the increase of blood pH, hemoglobin, as the carrier of oxygen, holds onto oxygen too strongly. So it's kind of ironic, taking the full breaths as advocated by William Walker Atkinson, it doesn't serve to increase oxygen delivery throughout the body. Um, it can actually reduce it. And I think many of us intuitively understand this because I'm sure there's times that you've taken full deep breaths and then you're feeling lightheaded. And it's not just that hemoglobin is holding on to oxygen too strongly when you take these full deep breaths, but the full deep breaths is also causing your blood vessels to constrict. 
So our blood circulation is impeded if we are breathing more air than what we need. And one organ that needs a lot of oxygen, of course, is the brain. So the brain, 2% of our body weight, but it requires 20% of our oxygen. We can influence oxygen delivery to the brain by virtue of the volume of air that we breathe, but by following William Walker Atkinson's idea of the full breath, that is not going to increase oxygen delivery to the brain. So let's look again at a couple of sentences that are, have been written by Magdalena. Blood circulation also reduces, making oxygen less available where it's needed. Nevertheless, the influence the book had on subsequent Euro-American and Indian yogis is remarkable. The complete breath entered pranayama curriculums around the globe. So, for example, one of the Swamis refers to it as the seminal asana. And um, so a few yogis realized that Rama Charaka was not a South Asian yogi, and even fewer opposed his ideas on the value of deep breathing. But one of the earliest to argue against overbreathing is Mabel E. Todd, a lecturer of bodily balance and bodily economics at Teachers College, Columbia University. In her generally influential The Thinking Body, a study of the balancing forces of dynamic man. So some individuals, as in this instance here, um, Mabel E. Todd, she says in quotes, the virtue of full breathing has been very much overestimated. So the virtue of full breathing has been very much overestimated. And she wrote this in 1937. In the tidal air of quiet breathing, there is all of the oxygen needed for the use of the individual under ordinary circumstances. Interesting. There's also oxygen as well as carbon dioxide exhaled from the lungs. The amount of residual air present in the lungs is sufficient to keep the oxygen balanced. When a greater amount of oxygen is needed for the body cells, as in extreme activity, such as physical exercise, there is deeper and faster breathing, not wider, fuller breathing, unless hysteria is present. Okay, so it's very interesting. People talk about taking the full breath. Where does it originate from? Does it increase um, oxygen delivery throughout the body? And we learn that it's pretty recent. It's pretty recent.